And good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Hello and welcome to uh, my tech talk, uh, Getting Started with Flask. I am Mason Egger of DigitalOcean, and I'm super excited today to go ahead and get going with Flask with you today. So how's everyone doing this morning? I see we've already got some people in the chat. It's hello. It's great to say everyone. Hello, Brandon. Nice to nice to see you here. Hello. Going to go ahead and just, hi, everyone. It's so nice to see it. Look, you're all, all your names are on the screen. Woo! I hope everyone's doing well this morning. It is a kind of dreary day here in Austin, Texas today. It's uh, it's humid. It's humid. It's one of the things I don't like about, I don't like humidity. I grew up near the coast and now I'm here again. I'm not here again. I'm in Austin, which is actually quite a ways from the coast, but it's still humid and I don't like it. Um, but I can lament about that forever. But yeah. Hello everyone. It's great to see everyone. Hi, Jose. Uh, hi, Uni. I hope, sorry if I'm getting, hi, Kimza. Hi, Nerissa. Hope everyone, I hope, hi, Jothy. I hope I'm doing a great job with your names. I'm trying my best. Um, yeah, late out, says it's late afternoon here. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that. Draw it, draw it. That's a cool name. Um, but yeah, late afternoon there. Yeah, it's, it is currently 10 o'clock in the morning here. Um, it's not a bad day. It's going to, I think it's going to rain, but we're good. Gaston's from Argentina. Brandon's from Iowa. I haven't been to Iowa yet, but I end up air corn. Yeah, there's lots of corn in Iowa. Um, awesome. Well, it's great to have everyone here this morning. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Flask. So this is a beginner intro to Flask uh, uh, webinar today. So if you've never... Um, if you've never programmed in Flask today, today is going to be a good day for you. We're going to start at the beginning and we're going to end with a deployment of a site on App Platform. So let's go ahead and get started and let's see where it goes. We have more people, a lot of people still popping in. It's great to see everyone. 11 p.m. here. Well, you must really like me if you're popping in at 11 p.m. Because <laughs> like I'm usually in bed by then. Uh, it's just awesome to see everyone here. It's great. So... Flask. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to pull up a browser and we're just going to talk about the Flask project. So Flask is a very popular, one of the most popular Python micro frameworks. Um, when it comes to Python web frameworks, I can name about four or five off the top of my head. There's Flask, there's Django, there's Pyramid, there's uh, Fast API, which is relatively new. And I'm actually, hopefully I'll get to do a tech talk on Fast API soon. Um, I actually have to learn Fast API. I've never worked with it before. So it's going to be pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, Flask is a micro, micro Python framework. Um, and essentially micro framework in the Flask world doesn't mean like, you know, it, it means that they keep the core of the of the web server or of the of the framework really simple, and they make it extremely extensible. So you can extend um, the Flask the Flask micro framework with a lot of things. But like, whereas Django has like a lot of stuff built in, it has its own like authentication built in. It has its own. Uh, I think the biggest part about Django that everyone really likes, the things that I like about Django, is the. Um, the database manager, the the object relational manager, or ORM, like the fact that it has its own ORM is what makes Django really popular. But Flask itself doesn't have any of that. Like you have to bring in Python libraries and stuff. And that's what makes it a micro framework. Um, it's really good for deploying relatively small microservices. I've deployed, um, I've deployed a handful of Flask microservices. So like if you're looking to like keep your footprint down, like if you're worried about the size, like if you're deploying microservices and you're worried about the size of your Docker container, and you don't need all of the extra things that Django brings, um, then Flask is a really great way to go with it. Um, I love their little like I don't I don't know if this is supposed to uh, it's, oh it's a flask like a like a like a deer horn flask or like a horn flask. For the longest time in my life, I thought that was a jalapeno. Like, and it makes sense. It's flask, and I was always wondering why there was a jalapeno on the flask page, but turns out it's a flask. So. Let's go ahead and just get started with Flask. So the first thing we're going to do is like I, I have a uh, developer environment set up. So let's go ahead and just get everything set up. So I have my, um, this is VS Code. I could not remember what it was called there for a second. I have VS Code open. I'm going to go ahead and open up a terminal. And what we're going to do is we're just going to, come on, 
do it like that. And then we're going to open this up. And then I want to bring over a little web browser here. So if I, I should be able to just snap these into place, but it does not seem it like it wants to snap the way I would like it to today. It worked perfectly yesterday, which is of course how it works. Like it never works live. But basically I just want to set up my environment to where I can see I'm going to basically have local local host 5000 ready to go here. There's not going to be anything on it yet because we're not running a Flask server yet. No, ran it. It is not a jalapeno. It is um it is a very power is a is a flask. Um so yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and just have this ready up 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 and loaded here. So um the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a virtual environment for this. So if you're if you're using uh, Python, I need to close Steam so I don't get Steam notifications. <laughs> um, and we'll go ahead and close Discord while we're at it. Um, if you're going to be developing anything in Python, like if you're going to be doing a library, you're going to be doing an application, it's very, very much recommended that you use a virtual environment, which basically creates a local copy of Python for us, and it allows us to... Um, it will allow us to basically install Python and then install packages kind of in isolation so we don't mess with any, so that nothing gets um, mixed up, especially with system Python. Since a lot of your, there's actually a lot of tools in your um, in your computer, like on Linux that rely on Python. If you start installing libraries into system Python, you can definitely uh, mess stuff up. So we're going to go ahead and just create a, a virtual environment called Flask. So it's python-m vn tilde slash dot virtual ends slash Flask. And then we're going to go ahead and activate it. So it's tilde source tilde slash virtual ends flask bin activate. Excuse me. So now that you see that we have this flask right here, this basically means that we're now within our virtual environment. Uh, so Kavita asks, um, for every project, do we have to create a virtual environment? I would. I, I very much would create a new virtual environment for every project. Um, you don't want dependencies to be just clashing around with each other, you want it to be kind of, like you want a fresh space every time. It really does help. Um, now, that being said, for like personal development on my machine, I have a flat, I have a virtual environment that is like everything. It's where I dump everything. But that's the one that I activate whenever I am like in my REPL or I'm just messing around. Like I'm not actually, I, I'm writing a little script to accomplish something really fast. I'm not actually thinking about like what I'm going to do with it or anything like, like my, my playground, I would call it is just a, a dumpster of every Python library that I've ever wanted to play with in one place. Now for every application that I create, I 100% create a new virtual environment or virtual environment. Um, you don't want to be in like, not only do you want to make sure that your dependencies don't clash, but like, we're going to deploy this to app platform which the way that we do that is we pip freeze and we take our requirements and we when we put it in GitHub, App Platform will take it um, and install all those packages. If I have everything in there, I'm going to have a lot of things that don't need to be installed. It's going to make the Docker container bigger. It's going to make the, the deploy slower. Um, and we don't we don't want that. So like keep everything as minimal as I see. Okay, to clarify, uh, I see Linux and Windows. Are these terminals CMDs for Windows? These terminals are Linux Windows. This is the wonderful world of Windows subsystem for Linux. It is, um, I have a really cool blog post that I need to update on my personal site, but it is it is 100% how I code now. Um, I used to program on Macs. I like Macs. Um, I used to always have problems with Docker for Mac. Ugh. But um, the Windows subsystem for Linux allows me to install a Linux-like operating system, or basically, so this is Ubuntu 20.04. Um, like I go to, uh, da, 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 Microsoft, not word. <laughs> this is what happens when you don't. So I go to store and then if we go here and we just type like Ubuntu, I can install windows. I can install Ubuntu 2004 on this. And then I have basically what's a virtual machine. So the windows subsystem for Linux one did some. I don't know how it did exactly. Windows subsystem for Linux 2 or WSL2 uh, provide basically runs Linux in Hyper-V, which is the Windows virtualization server um, in the background. And now you have direct Linux access. The other cool thing, and I don't have it running because it was being weird last night. I think the latest update of Docker um, messing things up. You can have Docker for desktop running on Windows and then just link it into, your, into, into any of your Windows subsystems for Linux 
and you can just access Docker. It's so cool. I don't need, I, I can program 100%. I do my entire job on Windows now using the WSL. I absolutely love it. So that's a great question. I may just do a whole tech talk on WSL. If that's something that people would like to see, please um, please drop it in the comments because I've, I've wanted to do that talk, but I don't know if it would be valuable. So if that's a talk you want to hear, tell me yes in the comments and we'll, um, I'll, maybe I'll do a talk on that. Uh, someone has asked when you're deploying to app platform, you can use environment variables as we do for production. Yes, we do. Uh, oh, can I use environment variables? Um, yeah, I'll do it. I'll show you how to use some environment variables. That works. Uh, can we have both Linux and then carry out the projects? Yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. Um, you know what? If people want to see that tech talk, I'll give it. It may not be the most like, maybe not everybody will show up to it, but I'll 100% do a tech talk on it because if it's something that people think is valuable, that's what I'm here for. So let's go ahead and create our first file, app.py. And let's just do a hello world Flask. So, oh, we haven't finished our virtual environment yet. I'm sorry. So we need to install Flask and then, yes, is this what I'm going to do? Okay, we're going to install Flask and we're going to install G-Unicorn, or Gunicorn, however they say it. Um, we're going to use that later for, um, de for development or for, uh, produ for productionizing whenever we deploy it. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do pip freeze requirements, requirements.txt. And that's gonna create a, basically our requirements. So if I, oh, I did it in the wrong spot, I'm sorry. Uh, CD code, Mason, uh, this is Flask to Tech Talk. Pip freeze requirements.txt. We refresh right here, we have requirements.txt. Am I going to be using uWSGI? No, I use G-Unicorn. Um, uh, I don't use uWSGI. I've used uWSGI in the past, but today, for today's example, I'm going to use uh, Gunicorn just because it works. I think it's a little bit easier to, to configure with um, App Platform because app, all I have to do is configure App Platform. I don't have to configure, or Gunicorn, I don't have to configure the um, like any of the Nginxy parts. And I have, I've have i only ever configured uWSGI with Nginx, so I'm sure I could figure it out, but I haven't done it in a long time. So for today, we're going to use Gunicorn. You could 100% use uWSGI. I don't think it would be a problem. Um, and then the other thing, I'm going to uh, go ahead and install. Uh, I'm going to actually do this. I'm going to do. So we've got our requirements, and then I'm not going to freeze the requirements again. So I'm going to do a pip install black and pilot. This will basically give my editor magic power. Like it's going to auto format my code, and it's going to basically do uh, intel not IntelliSense, but kind of like a static analysis of my code. And I want that. So. Uh, and then the next thing I need to do here is I need to actually find my interpreter path. So we're going to browse my file system. Um, because I just created it before I had closed, uh, before I had opened this, like it's not going to show up. Sometimes it takes a little while for, ver for VS Code to find it. So sometimes it just works better if I just go through and select it and it just makes life a whole lot easier. And now we're in our virtual environment in VS Code, as we can see down here. Oh, that's sad that work blocks WSL. I love it. Um, whenever I first joined DigitalOcean, we were giving that we were given the uh, the choice between um, a MacBook or a Lenovo, and I've used MacBooks my entire career. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to dedicate myself to learning how to use WSL. I'm going to get the Lenovo, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to just be upset about it. Um, and it's worked perfectly, and I haven't been upset about it yet. I have heard that every now and then you have some weird issues with VPN and DNS resolution, but I don't have to usually get on a VPN for mine, so it doesn't work. It doesn't really cause that much of a problem. So first thing we do is we import Flask and then we create a Flask application. So this is how you create a Flask app. Basically, you create a variable that creates a, that goes to a constructor of a Flask object. The Dunder name here is basically what determines like the context and the name and how the file is running. Um, so that way it knows to run it. Hey, this is the Flask app, this file. We're gonna go ahead and do app.route and we're going to say at the index, we're going to do something. And then we're going to say def hello world. And we're going to go ahead and do return hello world. And we're going to save that. And as you can see, it automatically formatted. Like if it, it does a lot of that, I told that thing not to bug me. Um, so now what we do is we come over here and we have to, uh, tell Flask which what, what our application is. So we're going to export Flask app equals app.py. And then we basically do a Flask run. 
So as you can see, it says serving Flask app, app.py. The environment is production. And if I come over here and refresh the page, we should get hello world on our page. So this is the hello world app. Um, and it's 404 on the favicon like it always does. Everything does that. Now, one of the things we can do that I actually really like um, is you can set your Flask uh, environment to development. This really helps um, whenever you run into issues. So if I set the so if I set it to Flask in uh, development, or the the very sorry ah, the environment variable is Flask underscore env equals development, and then I do Flask run. It's the same thing. If I refresh, nothing really happens. But if I say go to well, no, not ASDF. Um, I, okay, I know. So let's say let's say I have an I, I have an error in my code. Um, like I remove that string and I try to I try to hit this again. It's going to say, "Hey, you have a syntax error. You forgot the quotation marks over here." But also, it gives me the stack trace in the browser, and it's really nice and easy to see. Um, and I really like this because like whenever I'm running and building Flask apps, I'm usually like running the code and then I have like a, something over here. I'm normally not looking at this. I don't want to have to go back and scroll through the Flask logs. So being able, so like whenever I run into the error, error to immediately be able to see it in the browser is super valuable to me. So I definitely recommend uh, taking advantage of it. So if we come back over here and we add our quotation marks back in and we save Flask auto reloads. So I don't have to worry about like, starting and stopping the server and I run it and we're back to hello world. Sorry, thirsty. Um, so Kavita asks, do you have Docker installed in your machine? I have Docker desktop installed for windows and then Docker desktop, like literally in the settings, there's a little checkbox that says exposed to WSL. So Docker desktop for Windows also now runs in the WSL. So there's actually two virtual machines. There's a virtual machine running Docker and there's a virtual machine running Ubuntu. And then what it, I believe what that check mark does is it just exposes it across a TCP port. But I'm not 100% positive. I've never actually dug into it. But if I was designing something like that, that's exactly how I would do it. So I'm going to assume that's what happened. Um, awesome. Well, I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're finding it helpful. I'm that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help people. So let's go ahead and move on and add links. If anyone, also, if you have any questions at all, please drop them in the chat. I will totally um, answer them. Oh, I, I missed a question. So can you run an app across different virtual environments? As long as the requirements are installed that you need for your app in both virtual environments, you can 100% run an app in multiple virtual environments. When you say different, I mean, like, yeah, if I have, I activate like virtual environment one and then I activate virtual environment two, um, after deactivating VN1, as long as they have the same requirements, you can. Um, and that is kind of like a somewhat known thing is like if you like maybe you have different virtual environments, one that has like a lot of debugging tools, and maybe you run it in that VN when you need to debug, but then there's also the productionized version. Um, and you run it in that. So that's definitely uh doable. Uh you asked so this saves us installing VMs. This is back to the WSL question. Yes, this hundred percent saves you from install and having to install VMs. I have installed no physical VMs. I installed that thing from um, I, you know, I'm, I'm really going to do this. Uh, Magic Voice in the Sky, who's here, remind me that I would like to do a WSL talk. I have net moderators in the back, and I forget things, but but the Magic Voice in the Sky, who sometimes comes in and speaks, will tell, will remind me. So, um, I'm actually, you know what, I'm actually going to write it down right now because I have a whole list of like, um, I'm currently working on a list of like, what am I going to do for the next quarter? And I've got like a little list. So now I won't forget. Um, Anyways, yes, it saves me from VMs. Uh, this terminal right here that you're seeing is not the terminal uh, that comes with it. This is actually the new Microsoft Windows terminal. Like they recreated an open sourced CMD. And like I can open up an Ubuntu 1804 shell because I still have it installed, an Azure Cloud shell, an Ubuntu 2004, a PowerShell, a command prompt. Um, so it does everything. And it basically lets I can have multiple Windows, which we actually are going to need a second one later. So I'm just going to leave that open. Um, and I can have multiple little windows in there and it's it's amazing i love it um i can play i can i can switch back and forth between playing some video games and playing some overwatch playing a lot of valheim lately um <laughs> and switching back and coding and i don't have to be on a different different computer and it's it's almost it's seamless um it is 2021 and the future is now so let's add some more routes just for the sake of adding routes we're going to go ahead and add so whenever you want to add a route you just do app.route this is what's known as a decorator. And um, basically it's a way of 
taking a, like any function that's in here gets rewritten with the right, excuse me, gets rewritten and then like in, in, in the middle and stuff. So like I a decorate, there's a lot of really cool decorator talks. You should definitely check into them. So we're going to say def hello. And then this one's just going to return hello. Nothing super, nothing super uh, like mysterious about it. We do that one. We come over here to hello and it says hello. So like whenever you want to add like multiple endpoints, multiple routes for your, um, for your variables for everything or like for just when you're building your app, feel free to do all of this. Um, we're going to create a, Another one, app route, hello. And then what we're going to do now is we're actually going to say, like, we're going to have someone put their name here. So, like, they're going to say hello, and it'll say, like, their name. So, if you want to use variables, so this is how you would use variables. I'm sorry. I type, sometimes typing and talking at the same time are really hard. Are really hard. Um, so, this allows us to have uh, URL parameters. So, we'll be able to submit like hello slash Loki, which is the name of my dog, and the computer will say hello Loki. So, and then we're gonna use Python F strings here because I'm forcing myself to learn Python F strings, which are actually really cool. Um, only can use these if you have, I think Python 3.7 or higher, maybe 3.6, but this is definitely, oh, you have to, I'm sorry, you have to put, um, you have to put the variable, so you put the variable but you want inside of the less than greater than less than's, and then that has to be an argument to the function that that actually runs stuff. So that's why I gave you the little squiggly line. So if I come over here and I say hello and I say slash Loki, it'll say hello Loki. So whatever text I put in here will come through and be good. Huh? One second. Take a quick pause if there's any questions. Do your functions have to follow your decorators? Yes. So if you're in, so when you're doing, um, when you're doing, uh, yes, usually decorators or functions. When you're using Flask, you have to immediately decorate it. Now you can do, um, so we can do multiple decorators. We can kind of stack decorators. Um, so if we did app dot route. Both of these routes will now say hello. So if I come here and I go back to index and it'll say hello. And then if I go to slash hello, it'll also say the exact same thing. So we can stack decorators, but your function, like when you deck, you either are decorating a class or you're decorating a function. I don't, I've never really seen if, if Flask has um, class decorators, but I know that this is how they use their function decorator. So yes, you have to, your function immediately has to follow um, the decorator. There may be some weird stuff you can put here in the middle with some really advanced flask. Um, I'm unaware of any at this time. Um, so someone asks, so for Python, which course should would you recommend? There's so many ways of learning Python. Um, let me see if I can find... Yeah, so if you go to do.co slash python dash ebook, you can find a really nice ebook. Um that DigitalOcean has uh, created that will teach you a lot of things about Python. There's also a lot of really good Udemy courses. Um, I personally like automatetheboringstuff.com. It's like a, it's a really good book for like beginner Python stuff. So if you wanna learn Python, I would say like learning the core language, that's a good place to start. Um, Jose asks, is it better to you if you use JSONify? Yes, like right now I'm just returning hello and we're just doing that. We are 100% probably gonna be doing some returning JSONify stuff uh, here in a second. This is just like the beginning. So we're gonna get to that in a second. Uh, if you're building like REST APIs and stuff, you 100% want to be returning a JSON object. Um, do the definitions under a decorator only exist in the local scope of the decorator or are they global to similar to local variables in the... Huh. Let's find out. So let's say, let's just call hello. If it exists here, then it's in the global scope. Uh, I have to say hello name. Hmm. Intriguing. You would think that this would have broke, but it didn't. Oh, um, let's craft a string. I'm being silly. So let's say S equals this return yes like that sorry i was being silly let's close this file browser so you can see the code 
Yes, so they exist in the global scope. Great question. I, I I'm pretty sure the decorator. So a decorator can't. A decorator doesn't really like remove stuff from a scope. It just rewrites it and adds it. To my understanding, like this is kind of getting like a little bit into the weeds of decorators. Um. So yeah, this this does exist in the global scope. So you can still call these functions if you want to, as I just did here. Uh. Awesome. So cool. Uh, oh, Automate the Boring Stuff is also a Udemy course. And if you watch Al Swigert's uh, Twitter, he occasionally gives it away for free. Can you specify app.route arguments together with their types? Int string, maybe even more complex, and validate them as part of the app.route flask functionality? I do not know. That is a great question. Um, let me see. Let's like, so Python, uh, let's see. Does flask have type hints? Um, looks like there's like this thing called flask hint, which helps with data with helps with classes. But, and it looks like you can do type hints here. So, but it doesn't look like it's in the base. It looks like you actually have to use a separate library for it. Um, usually when you have, well, usually when you have to validate like functions and stuff, or sorry, when you usually have to validate uh, parameters you have usually invalidate them inside the body. So I don't know if there's a way to validate them within the app.route context. Now you could possibly you could always wrap a decorator around the decorator and write your own in there. Um there might be something like that in a third party library, but I don't think Flask has it. Okay. And basically someone asked the same question. So yes. Um I hope that answered it. Answered your questions. Awesome. I'm really enjoying the engagement today. This is awesome. So the next thing we're gonna do uh, is we're gonna talk about some request data. So up here, we're just gonna come up here and we're gonna say request. So request is a special global variable in Flask that whenever the request data comes in, I will be able to I will be able to see it. Um, so let's just do an app dot route. We're gonna call this slash data, right? Is that what I'm calling? Yeah, I'm gonna call it slash data. Def data, and then we're just gonna say let's return the request method. So I want to know if this was a pose, if this was a get, um, and this was a get. So 100%, um, you can go ahead, you'll be able to get all this data. So like if someone does do, does a post to your API, you're going to be able to get that data from that, which we're actually about to do right now. So let's, let's make it a little bit interesting real quick. And let's create what I'm going to call an in-memory cache or an in-memory data store. Now, when you're doing this in production, you would 100% want to connect this to something like Redis. But for the sake of this demo, we're just gonna um, we're just gonna keep it like in the running space. So, if basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all post data. Um, so let's set this up to be a post. So if you want to say, hey, I want to want this method to be a post, we're going to say methods equal, and then it basically it's a list. And you can say get or post. Um, so we're going to do both. We're going to do a get and we're going to do a post. So the cache one will do, will either, it's either going to be a get or a post. And depending on what it is, we're going to do different things. So this is actually really useful for login forms. If someone does a get on their login form, you would maybe, like that means that they're visiting your login web page, maybe. Um, you could redirect them to the login form like the actual, like the, the web page that contains the HTML form. If they do a post, then they've probably submitted username and password. Then you can take them through the login steps. Um, and then you could do that. Okay, I'm looking at some of the, uh, some of the questions. Uh, explain an orphan process and a zombie process. It's a little bit outside the scope of this uh, tech talk. I'll get to, if I have time at the very end, I will come back to that. Um, how to create a chat app without internet work connection. Uh, if you don't have internet connection, you're not going anywhere. Um, you may be able to do it within the local network, um, but if you don't have internet, you're nothing's happening. So yeah, can't. Um, anyway, we're gonna get back to the data here. And what we're gonna do is if request.method equal equal post, and you have to do it all uppercase. Then what we want to do is we were, we're just going to do what's called memcache, which is our dictionary. It's just a regular Python dictionary, dot update, uh, request dot JSON. So basically what this does is update is a Python method that allows you to just like 
if there's if there's it takes two dictionaries and it just updates it. So if, if this dictionary has like A, B, and C as its keys, this one has D, E, F as its keys, it just merges them key and value. If there's an if there's like A and A as in both of them, it will replace it so it updates the current data. This is a way of just like kind of gathering all of your data without having to um like say you have like you have say you have a dictionary that's like A, B, C, one, two, three as the key values, and then A, B, C, one, uh, five, four, five, six. Instead of going you know, instead of looping through it and saying, you know, this one equals this, this one equals this, you just do a dot update and it replaces it. So it's really a really cool method. Request.json is going to return a dictionary of whatever data that we got in our post. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and say return success. Um, you have to return something in Flask, either a string, an in, a string, a tuple, uh, a couple of other things, but you have to return something. If we didn't return something here, it would not work. And then else, we're actually going to return. This is where someone had asked. We're going to return JSONify memcache, and we have to import this really quick. So JSONify is an amazing little uh, dictionary, or sorry, a little little method that just converts a dictionary immediately into JSON and then returns it up into JSON, does all the encoding and stuff. Um, so it's really cool. So if we come over here and we do slash cat, oh, we have an error. What's it? Well, actually, you know, let's just see what it says. There we go. Uh, while importing app, an import error was no, cannot import name memcache. I typed the wrong thing. They sonify. Sometimes I type wrong things. <laughs> Try again. That's weird. There is JSONify. Did I miss JSON Fi? If I man, typing is hard. What? Oh, my bad. There we go. So as you can see, when we have a get right here, nothing, nothing happens. We have nothing in our dictionary. Now, if we make a, a post request, which I know a lot of, like you can use like a Postmate or something. I actually have a really cool command line tool um, that I'm going to show you real quick because if you've never seen it, uh, I'm about, if you've never seen this tool, I'm about to change your life. So HTTP IO is the easy way of doing, um, is the easy way of doing like curl commands and stuff. Like I love it. Like you do like HTTP put, like, and then you just say hello equals world and it puts it there. So I'm going to use it real quick. So it's HTTP IE. It's actually a little Python script um, that you can install as a command line tool. And then when we use it over here, it's HTTP post localhost colon 5000 dash. And then whatever I want for key value pairs, like I don't have to form any JSON and send it. So I'm going to say dog equals Labrador name equals Loki. We're uppercase that. And as you can see, we've sent a post request. And if I come back over here to the get, now I have dog and name, um, dog Labrador named Loki. If I want to change the dog's name to Buck, it was the name of my very first Labrador. Um, I come back over here, the update method replaces it. I think I can even do like, I don't know how I would do lists here. Hmm. Anyway. Loki will say color equals brown. Uh, and as you can see, this is this is how we do it. So whenever we post, we run it runs through here and it basically just grabs the data and updates it. And whenever we do a get, we can just JSONify all of the data. Now, if I stop this, so if I come over here and I stop this and I rerun it and I run get again, it's gonna be empty because we're using an in-memory dictionary that's running while the app is running. So as soon as this app is gone, it's not gonna work anymore. So this is not how you would do something in production. You would probably use like a Redis cluster here and it would be really useful. How to deploy on a new Ubuntu server. Um, we have some really great tutorials for that. Let us uh, let me look and see if I can find one real quick. I'm not gonna get around to deploying on Ubuntu. We're gonna use app platform today. Uh, Flask Ubuntu. So if you wanna know how to do Flask applications, on Ubuntu 2004, you can use this. And if you want to know how to do with, that's with UWSGI, which someone had, I think, uh, who had asked for it before? 
I don't remember. Someone asked for it in the previous in the chat. And then if you want to do it with G Unicorn, you can use this and you'll get um you'll get these are so these are a hundred these are DigitalOcean tutorials that you can follow to do that uh if you want. So now what we're gonna do is what's next on my list? We're gonna talk about templating a little bit. So I'm gonna do one real quick thing. I'm gonna go ahead and grab a cp dot dot slash Classic tech talk dash guide templates dot. Okay, so I have, I'm going to make a directory here uh, called templates, and I already have a uh, base template ready that I've created. So I'm going to move the base template into templates. So the base template, um, boop, 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 is basically just an HTML app that, um, that doesn't go there. So we'll remove this. We haven't done that yet. Um, that basically just has the DigitalOcean logo with a nice pretty blue background. Um, what we're gonna do real quick is we're gonna use templates. So, uh, um, sorry, I got a great question. Before I go on, actually I'm gonna finish my thought then I'm gonna answer the great question that just came into the, into the uh, chat. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, Flask uses uh, what's known as Jinja, Jinja or Jinja 2, which is a templating library that um, a lot of Python apps use for basically rendering templates in HTML. So Flask not only does like REST APIs and stuff, you can totally use it to serve full web pages. So what we're going to do next is we're going to kind of do a really quick run through through the templates and then we're going to deploy. So someone asked about Flask cores. This is a great question. The library, I believe, is just called Flask-Cores. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post it in here. Uh, on there it goes. So Flask dash cores, and I've basically all you have to if, if you're doing a very simple usage, all you have to do is import cores and the do cores app. So Flask does not handle cores out of box. Oh, like and that's that's kind of comes back to the micro framework part is that cores is important, but Flask wanted to be the smallest thing possible, and not everything is going to need cores, so they left it to a library. Now, the Flask cores library, I've used a lot of times. I've built a lot of apps with my uh, coworker Chris, um, who you may have watched some of his tech talks before, and I all he always, Mason, you forgot to add the cores. I'm like, ah, and I have to go back, and I have to install this really quick, and it's usually a very easy fix. So, um, out of box, Flask not supported, but there's a great library that does and um, it's, as you can see, it's an extra line of code and it makes it really nice. So if we go ahead and what am I gonna do? We're gonna do templates. So what we're gonna do now is we're just gonna come over here and say, well, actually first, let's just, let's render the template without anything. So let's go ahead and just delete all of this stuff because we don't really need it. And we're just gonna go to the index page. Actually, wait, we're not, we, we do need some of it. We're going to keep this memcache one, um, but we're going to change it up a little bit. I just want to keep that code there. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of that hello because I don't want it. Um, or actually, no, what we're going to do is a name here. So, and then what we do now is we're going to have to import another thing, which is the Flask library's render template, which will just allow us to render the template. And we're going to render template base.html we're going to say name is equal to none so we're going to give it a default value if they send us a name great if they don't who cares and we're going to say name equals name so basically what we've done is we've created so if you just do it without anything it's just going to say well it will currently it's not going to it's going to say not just hello there and then it'll say hello your name we haven't implemented that yet but this is just so i can show you what the uh what the web page looks like. I'm not running Flask right now. Flask run. Oop. Oh, we're not running cache anymore either. We want to run the front page. Oh dear. Oh, I haven't saved this. There we go. So this is the this is the home page that we've created. Um, if we just want to create like a really nice little, we're gonna basically create a little a hello hello world homepage. Um, and what we're going to do now is, so now if someone sends a name, we're good. So let's go ahead and add some like Jinja templating. So we come over here. Um, we're going to do it inside this content div. And we're just going to say H2. Uh, we're going to do curly brackets, parentheses, uh, parentheses na uh, if name. 
I don't know why it does that. It, like whenever I hit enter, it ought, like one of my HTML things tries to remove those little curly brackets. So if the name is there, we're going to say h1 hello uh, and then double curly brackets name in curly brackets in h1. Uh, else, nope, come on. Oh my goodness, stop. Uh, if they don't send us the name, we're going to say hello there. General Kenobi. And then we're going to end if. Okay, so now we have that. So if we refresh our page, it says hello there in a nice big bold text. Now, if we send our name, <laughs> you have to actually put a name there. You, I put a name, but say hello, Loki, or hello, Mason, or hello, Sam. And Every name, as you can see now, our Jinja template detects. If, if there is no name, just say hello, hello there. Um, but if there is a name, go ahead and just greet it. And then that pretty cute. So, so you are going to enter name based condition. Yes, that's exactly what I did. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do one more thing before we get to deploying. And I think we're actually doing like great on time. This is like set to end at the perfect time. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to just take some of this logic and we're all, we're going to change this. We're going to change this to greeting, greeting. Uh, we're going to change this to a post. So this is going to be the way that you're just, people are just going to post to this endpoint. We're going to change this name to greeting. And then we're going to remove this if post. We're going to take this over, move this, delete this. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow people to send whatever they want, and then we're going to display it on the web page, at least while the app is running. So the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to do a little for loop. Um, for key value in greetings.items, we're going to go ahead and say... We're going to create a new paragraph. Uh, let's do it like this. Let's do OL at ordered list. Uh, is it you? Unordered list? Is that it? I, I'm, I'm having the biggest brain fart right now. It is UL. Okay. My brain was like, that does not look right, but it is. So I was totally just like, what is going on? Uh, and then what we're going to do is for every key and item, we're going to create a list item and we're going to say uh, key. Actually, we'll, uh, says, and then we're going to say value. So basically it's just going to create a little list item every time. Uh, and so anytime anything is in there, it's basically like Loki says hi, Sam says hello, things like that. And four, and we have that. So if we if we run this, whoop! I made a boo boo. Oh, didn't that didn't send greetings? So we're gonna change the name of Memcache to. Now we're not. We're just gonna do this. Name equals name, greetings equals Memcache. We just have to pass it in. And I seem to have a random square bracket. There it is. So we refresh this and there's nothing there. But if I come back over here to this post and I say uh, where we've changed the name of this to greetings. And then um, Loki equals hi, Sam equals good morning. We've, oops, I made a boo-boo, what did I do? It says method not allowed. Oh, it's greeting, not greet. Well, we'll just change it here. Success, and if I refresh this page, it says Loki says hi, Sam says good morning. As you can see, my dots are a little bit out in the weird spot, weird area. But um, but yeah, and that that is basic templating with Django and, or sorry, with Flask and Jinja.
So what we're going to do next is we're going to deploy this to DigitalOcean's app platform. So we're going to do repo.new. And we're just going to call this Flask Tech Talk. I'm going to go ahead and create a repository. And then we're just going to come back over here. We're going to say git. Uh, I'm not in the right directory here. Let's go ahead and stop this. So vim.git ignore dot vs code high cache get in it get status uh that looks good um the do app platform is a platform as a service i don't know a lot about elastic beanstalk but um it's similar to like a kind of Heroku style thing where basically we're just going to upload code and it's going to work. Um, oh, we haven't done the G unicorn stuff yet either. So uh, we're going to go ahead and I'm just going to do a really quick um, G unicorn config.py. We're going to say bind equals 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 colon 8,000. And we're going to make two workers. This basically just lets us set up a, a WSGI, so that way we can kind of somewhat multi like it gives us more workers that are actually accepting the requests. So we're going to do that, and then I'm going to do one other thing, which is a proc file. This is web, and I'm just going to copy and paste this from here. Um, this is basically just the way of running the um, the app. So G Unicorn, and then you need this like double dash work dir, work temp dir dev shim thing for um. Uh, this is some weird error in like, I think it's either in, it's, I think it's in Docker about being, not being able to access non-root directories and stuff. And then config, we're going to say our configuration is guniform config.py and we're going to run our app. So that's all just for um, running uh, our app on that platform. Now it's, you don't have to do some of this stuff. I'm kind of like, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm getting ahead of, I'm getting ahead of myself because I know what's coming. But if you need to learn about how to do all of this, there's a DigitalOcean GitHub sample Flask. This is the sample Flask app that I built um, that runs on that platform. And you can literally just fork it and it has all of these exact same thing. Here's the proc file. Here's the G Unicorn config. Um, so you should be fine with all of that. So let's go ahead and finish creating our Git repository. So Git status, Git add dash A, Git commit dash S dash M, uh, init commit. Ay, 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 ay. Ah, come here. Oh, I broke it. I got it. It is being really mean to me right now. There we go. There we go. So we committed it. We're going to do a git branch dash m main. I've done a bigger M. I don't know if it makes a difference. Um, get remote add origin get at github.com colon mason egger slash flask tech talk dot get uh, get push dash u origin main. And now when we come over here, our code is here. I'm going to go ahead and post the GitHub link in the chat so that way if you want to Look at it, you can. Um, so that's the code, then that'll, that'll pro I'll probably leave this up for a very long time. So if you ever wanna just look at it. So now we have that there, let's go deploy to get to app platform. So cloud.digitalocean.com. Why am I logged? Oh, okay. Um, let me log in over here. Wrong password. And I have to use my two-factor auth. Uh, three, dang it, it changed right as I started typing it. All right. uh, so let's go to apps. And we're going to deploy through GitHub. We're going to choose a repository and we're going to edit my GitHub permissions. I only ever allow a 
I missed that one too. Yep, got it. I only ever allow so many uh, like certain things. So this one was called Flask Dash Tech Talk. And we're going to save it. We're going to come back to this. Select Flask Tech Talk. Flask Tech Talk. We're going to click Next. Uh, everything looks good. What port did we say we were going to set that on? In G Unicorn, we set it to port 8000. So we need to change this down here to port 8080 or 8000 right here. Um, and then because someone requested environment variables, we're going to just set this up in development mode. So flask env equals development. Um, so this would set an environment variable and basically this would just allow us to be able to take it. So then we're gonna click next. When we click next, we're gonna choose the $5 a month, really basic one. We're gonna click launch a basic app. And now we just wait for our application to go. This will take a little bit because it has to build and do all the things. So while we're sitting here waiting, does anyone have any questions for me? We are coming up on the end of the talk. So once we get it deployed, we'll be done. So exciting. go to Okay, so I I get there we go. Sometimes the the chat doesn't come in. Can you use WSL with PyCharm? Um I um I don't know. I imagine you can. I imagine like the PyCharm team is really awesome. I'm I'm actually needing to learn PyCharm um, because I'm going to be doing a tech talk for them hopefully in April. Um, like with them, um, I imagine that it does. I I I could not. They are such a good team. They provide like the JetBrains team provides such amazing IDEs. Um, I just like VS Code because I write in so many different um, programming languages all the time that I like having a unified experience across them. Whereas with PyCharm, you have like JetBrains, you have like IntelliJ, which is for Java, and then you have Go, Go Playland or Goland and then PyCharm. And um, so they're amazing. I, I will always recommend PyCharm to people uh, because, and actually I do use it whenever I need to debug because I still haven't figured out the VS Code debugger and the one in PyCharm is, is like the best. So I love it, So, but I don't know. Um, does, okay. Do you have, uh, sorry, I usually bring your name up whenever I do this. Do you have tech talks of how to deploy with web servers? Um, are you talking about like how to deploy Flask with web servers? Um, the tutorials that I posted show how to do it, but I can show you, I can do a tech talk on um, deploying Flask on bare metal servers if people would like. I'm totally down for doing that. I don't have any at the moment, but there are a lot of tutorials on DigitalOcean that, have, that do it. So um, yeah. I mean, in terms of sharing the storage, I have no idea about PyCharm in that. So does Dio support other tech stacks? Th so the cool thing about app platform is it supports everything. You can upload a container to Docker Hub and run it. You can, if you if you can put it in Docker, you can run it on app platform. Um, we we host like what are known as build, we use what are known as cloud native build packs and they allow us to, um, they allow us to just uh, like auto detect and build code and stuff. As we can, we'll look at the log, see what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, we support all sorts of tech stacks. So whatever you can put in a Docker container, you can run. Uh, there is a special plugin for WSL. So where are plugins? It's a. So remote WSL, uh, open any folder. I think it's the remote development pack. Yeah, this allows you to connect either to WSL, 
directly via SSH to a running droplet, which I've done before, or a running server, or develop inside of a container. So you could totally use like Docker and locally and do it. This is honestly my favorite. Um, yeah, I do have it installed. We'll make sure this is the right one. This is my favorite extension. Like down here, I select how like I can remote WSL. I can remote into a container. Um, there is like a remote SSH, but it's not showing up right now. Hmm. Oh, it's probably because I'm already like in one. But yeah, these are amazing and I highly recommend them. Apparently I need to reload. But I'm using it. Why do I need to reload? That's weird. Um, what VX code extension do you use for formatting? So how do I view my current, just my VS code extensions? Uh, installed. So I have Docker installed. I have Go installed. Jupyter, Python, Docker language basics, YAML. Oh, local installed. So better comments is an amazing one that I use. Um, the auto formatting that I use, I use the tool black and pilot. Um, those are just, you pip install them and that's built into VS Code. And you're just saying for my formatter, I want to use the black formatter. Um, for my VS Code, I use better comments. It really does make your comments better. Uh, bracket pair colorizer two helps you like see the different brackets. Uh, the community material theme, that's why all of my icons have such pretty pictures. Um, and then the material theme, just to give it that kind of cool look, icons, yeah. So that's why they, these have like HTML5 and the Python logos because I'm using the material icons theme. Any tip to learn delivering JSON with Flask? Delivering JSON with Flask is relatively straightforward. Just use JSONify. Like uh, go over here. Oh, we never, we never actually did it with this, did we? So what we could do is we could just return JSONify. Um, Uh, result colon success. And that'll say like, hey, we we, we were successful. Uh, how to access a database with Flask? Depends on your database. You're going to look, if you want to do like a relational database, you're going to look for something called SQL Alchemy. Uh, Redis has its own um, thing. Um, and you can use Redis. But yeah, SQL Alchemy is a very popular one that I usually recommend. Yeah, if I say DO, I mean DigitalOcean. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to say DigitalOcean, but like internally, that's what we call it. How does it serve multiple re requests? So basically, a WIS the WSGI allows you to create multiple, like basically processes, and then it just kind of like round robins through them. Let's check on our app. Let's see if it's deployed. Deploy container terminated. That doesn't make any sense. What happened? Did I, I did call it G unicorn underscore config, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it got through and weird. Let's just try running it again. See if that fixes anything. Um, if it doesn't, then we'll just call it a day here. Uh, how does it serve multi? I may have made a mistake. It's, it's possible. I, let me double check my code. It's G unicorn underscore config dot P Y. Yeah. The proc file. Yeah, it looks right. Uh, but yeah, so that's what, how a whiskey works. How would you use Flask to create an API first app? You would just return JSON. That's all you would do. Like instead of instead of using the templating stuff, you just start returning JSON, which is a lot of my a lot of my apps. I have a lot of REST API apps that I've built that are just Flask. Does it scale automatically when the app receives many requests? Currently, App Platform does not do that. You have to manually scale App Platform to do that for you. But there is going to, I believe, eventually that feature is going to be added. Um, So if I oh I oh do uh, oh daylight savings time Ugh. okay I don't know what's going on with this I probably made a mistake I'm going to um I will ask the peoples what's going on with it so uh yeah this is all we have this time um. Are any plans for talks about deploying Django apps? Yes, I I have a Django app uh, tech talk coming up soon. So we started with Flask. We're going to do Django next. Um, 
so yeah, I hope that uh, I hope that you enjoyed this today. This is all I have for today. Um, and I will talk with you all next. Episode. I'll I'll wait one second to see if there's any other last questions that come in, and I'm checking over here too. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone. I really hope that you. I hope that you enjoyed the talk today. And uh, my next talk, well, I think will. The no more things. So awesome. It's great seeing everyone and I'll talk with you later. Bye-bye.